You haven't come from anywhere special with any silver spoon. Your dad was a worker on the docks. Yeah. You read a grub and then you just got in, into something you love. It's on Dickie, Wal Dickie Walker. He's on uh, Tottenham Scout. Hi guys and welcome back to Marvin Herbert's Nothing But The Truth podcast. Co-hosted by myself, Christian Morgans. As always, we've got another fantastic guest. Today we've been lucky enough to be invited down to the beautiful home of Harry Redknapp. Harry, thank you very much for having us down here today. Christian, pleasure. And uh, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Fantastic. All good, yeah. Fantastic. So, I think first and foremost, the most important question is, what's the secret to your health at this age? You look in fantastic shape, Harry. Oh, I don't know. I, I exercise, you know. I like to get out and play golf and, uh, you know, and I'm not a drinker. I'm not a big boozer, you know. I sort of, uh, I enjoy a glass of wine and that's about me, really, when, you know, if I go out for dinner. But no, I try to try to keep reason, as fit as I can, you know, and um, I think that's, you know, you've got to be lucky as well, haven't you, with your health, you know, but uh, I've had a few issues over the years, heart problem, one or two other things, but no, I feel good. Yeah, you look fantastic, I must oh, say. Yeah, so, um, and how's the golf going at the moment? Then? Good, yeah, I love it. Absolutely love the game. I wish I'd have started playing when I was younger. I didn't start playing until I was 50, mm -hmm. so I'm never going to be good, that good, you know, my... You know yourself, I mean, you see kids, look, they're so supple and they can turn and it's all about turn. You know, when you get older, you become, I find it, you know, you get a little bit more. But I eat the ball well. I, I eat the ball good off the tee. I eat the ball quite long, you know, for, for my age and everything. Um, I played with three guys today. In fact, they'd all be 50 odd. And I was out driving them by 20, 25, 30 yards every hole. Yes. What's um, your average drive? Your, your, your average? Oh, yeah, drive? I suppose I eat it about 240. It's decent, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I eat about 240. That's long, mate. I do, what do you I mean about? I eat it long. That's really good, mate. And 14 is a tidy handicap. Yeah. It's not, I think. Yeah. It's, um... a certain parts of my. Today I eat it good, got round the green, and then today my chipping was bad. It was a little bit heavy, the course, and I tended to hit, you know. I'm never sure what to whip when you get round the green. You know, when you're about that 25, 30 yards off the green, it's that, you know, whether you're off running up with like an eight or a little eight iron or punching it in or something, maybe it's, uh, but no, I love it. I enjoy the game. Do you have regular lessons or is it sort of just natural? And just... Yeah, I start, I've had a few lessons. I've had a few lessons because my grip was bad. My hands were right under. Mm. And then you know, last time I went, you know, really try to sort my hands out and get them in a better position. And so since I did that, I've hit the ball better. Yeah, changing the grip's one of the toughest Man, things ever. Yeah, uh, like, I was sat, I'm sitting at home with a golf club yeah. at night, right, sitting there, like, just getting my hands used to being where, you know, in that position, because I found it difficult. Yeah, it feels foreign, doesn't it, when you yeah. go from round there to round there? Very strange. Yes, but um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a bit of research on you, um, doing a bit of reading up on you. Right. I didn't realise you played out in America. Yeah. Um, with the Seattle Saunders, was it? Sounders. 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 Seattle Sounders. And how was that at that time? Fantastic. I went over there with Bobby Moore and Jeff Hurst, yep. who I played with at West Ham. Bobby was like Captain England, the wins you know. Yep. There's no one ever played football for me like Bobby Moore. He was the most special person, uh, you know, outside my family I've ever met in my life. I love Moro. Uh, and I went to West Ham as a 15 year old and he was captain of the club. At that time, he was a young captain, but he was he had an aura about him. He was he was all East End boys at West Ham. We all came from within like five or six miles of the football ground, and we all most of our dads were dockers, worked in the docks. Like my my dad was a docker, and a lot of the lads. And Bobby, but Bobby was Bobby was the governor. He was the captain. He was the leader of the club. He was just he was like a film star. He he was a great player just lovely person he just he was class everything he did was class you know he had the best car he had the best house he had the best everything more oh. and he i loved him and he was just amazing person and mm. he was you know captain england to win the world cup 1966 it was amazing you know and jeff first who came say me him and jeff went to america together and jeff when you look back on it jeff scored a hat trick in the world cup final when england won the world cup mm. I mean, what an achievement. Mm. You know, not just to play and score, but to get three goals. Yeah, no one will ever do that again. Yeah, incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Did you mimic anything from them guys Did, to take through your life? Was there anything you nicked from their personality? Oh, loads, loads, Marv, loads. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, Bobby, we would talk, me and Bobby, uh, and I remember one night we were chatting and, you know, after a game in Seattle, and he said, Mary, do you know, 
I said, Bob, you were fantastic tonight. He read the game like this particular night and I said, you were different class. He said, oh, thanks, Harry. You know, he said, do you know all the years I played at West Ham? We had a great manager at West Ham, great coach, Ron Greenwood. He was a genius. He was the best football coach I've ever met. I've never met anyone could come near him. His ideas on the game and things that he implemented into football, you know, were amazing. Overlapping fullbacks. Fullbacks didn't overlap in the old days. They stand on the halfway line. He started getting fullbacks going forward. Near post runs from Jeff Hurst, Martin Peters, getting across defenders. That was all Ron Greenwood. But he said, all the years I played there, Bobby said to me, he never once said, well done. You see, he never came up to me and gave me a after a game say well done Bobby or well played Bobby never give me a well done he said maybe he thought I didn't need it because I was captain of England and whatever he probably thought oh Bobby he said but we all need that he said we all love a pat on the back when you've done a good job and I took that into management yep. and that was always important to me I love it if I'm the manager and I'll go upstairs in that boardroom after a game and the chairman come up to me and he go hey Harry well done today he did a great job brilliant if you love it, don't you? We all love a pat on the back. Whatever you do, there's nothing like in, you know, you'll get more out of people, I think, by telling them how good they are and what they can do than keep telling them what they can't do and that they're rubbish at something, you know. Yep. Encourage them. And especially, I think, with young kids as well, young players at football clubs. Encourage them, talk to them, get to know them, help them, you know. There's not enough of that in football, in, in professional football, in my opinion. But that pat on the back one was, was certainly saying that Bobby... You know, said to me, and it was something that stuck with me that day. When he said, "We all need a pat on the back," we all, and I thought, you, "You're spot on, Bob." You know, I'm also always went out my way to, to when the lads coming out and done well. I mean, listen, not if they're doing badly, they're not going to come and say, "Well done," when they've done crap. But when they've done well, hey, you're fantastic today. Mm -hmm. and people like Luca Modric. I used to say to Luca before, "Hey, Luca, they won't get near you today. You're so good. They will not get near you. You run the game. Run the. You're better than any of their players." And he used to love it. I used to see him get six foot from being five foot five. He was suddenly six foot six, you know. And I think that's important. Yeah, so talking about the different styles of managers, I mean, you look at Mourinho and he sounds like he's a little bit in the, the Greenwood sort of style. I've watched a couple of interviews with John Terry and Frank and he's mm. talking about how he'd walk down the corridors and ignore them and stuff like this for days and days at a time and just trying to sort of provoke a reaction. Then you've obviously got the Guardiolas and the mm. Klops who are more put the arm around. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I guess there's different ways to provoke the reaction, isn't there? Yeah, and yeah. Maybe the way that Greenwood did act, maybe obviously provoke Bobby Moore to be the player he was, obviously where he was. Yeah, but well, but I think Ron's personality was he was a quiet man, and he didn't. He was, you know, he was uh, he wasn't outgoing. You didn't know what he was thinking about you, really. But that was just his, his probably his personality, you know. But he was a great football coach, a gene absolute for me. As I say, he was a genius. So he had a massive influence on you going on to mm. become a coach you get into management and stuff like this yeah you took a lot of the tactical stuff from him but didn't take the yeah personality yeah. side of him as such. yeah no he was a nice but he was a nice man there was nothing you could ever look at ron green with uh yeah but it was very different in them days i mean we had he was we had to call him mr greenwood until we were in the first team and played enough games where he'd say he'd call me ron we used to call him ron he wasn't boss or in them days but up until then he probably up until the age of 20, whatever, he was Mr Greenwood, you know, we all, it was very different, the respect that the managers had in them days, I think was, was, and the way they, the, the difference, you know, the way they dealt with players was very different, you know, you had to make an appointment to see the manager, and it was, yeah, it was very, and, you know, different it, world. There's been a massive transition even over the last 20 years, hasn't it, as the players have become so rich and so powerful. Mm. That obviously maybe more powerful than managers now at times, aren't they? So yeah. I mean, so Alex Ferguson looked like the, the last old school manager, wasn't he? I can remember this mm. incident of him throwing a boot. What you mean, what you, I was going to say, what do you mean your players become more powerful than the manager? Well, in terms of certain players within clubs, influence-wise. Sorry. Influence-wise, you mean? Yeah, they're more powerful. Like people like Ronaldo, the Messi's mm. and stuff like this. They're arguably more powerful than any manager that would come into the club, and they can sort of dictate maybe to a degree. Yeah, yeah, it does happen. Even you know, Marvin. Even with um, you know, I met two fitness, uh, two fitness coaches who worked at Barcelona, and they were fantastic coaches. Spanish boys. They've been. They were with Pep all the time. He was at Barcelona, and they said that really, you know, Messi was so powerful. He could do really what he wanted. If he didn't feel like training, he wouldn't. He didn't train. If he didn't, you know, he'd come out some mornings have a little 
do a little bit and then go in. Mm. And I think Pep really probably, if we're on it, probably it's never come out, but I think Pep was probably, in the end, probably had problems controlling him, I would think. And so when they spoke about uh, Messi going to Man City, I thought, mm, I, I couldn't see it. I think, you know, Pep's got control of all the players, I would think, at Man City. And to have somebody in who may just be too powerful, even for him, maybe wouldn't have been the, something that he wanted to do. Yeah, so uh, talking about difficult players, who's the most difficult player you managed in your Slender career? Um, difficult, but great, was Di Canio. Paolo Di Canio. He was a genius. Again, for me, he was a genius. He, he was so good. And he was a fantastic professional. Uh, when The way he looked after himself, the condition he was in, he'd come in on us, he didn't drink, he ate all the right foods, he'd come in on a Sunday morning after a game, do an hour and a half, warming down, stretching, doing all his exercises. But he was temperamental. He'd have days where he'd come in, he'd have the ump about something, he used to walk past my office and he'd kick the door away out. <laughs> And the next day he'd come in, he'd have the sunglasses on, singing Valare, you know, and he'd be full of the joys. But he was, he was, he was temperamental. You had to handle him with, you know, any minute he could, have, he could have a blow up. So was he, he fit, put, fit as a fiddle. See, because this is the thing. Because my, my football academy, the time that soccer kids, I drum it into them, right? Like it don't matter how skillful you think you are, if you're not fit hmm. and your stat fest don't add up. You're not getting looked at. No. You need to be super fit. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the main things that I drive home to all the kids at our academy, you know. The, the fitness is the one that oh, you need massive. to focus on more than anything mm. initially. And then you'll find your position with your fitness. Like, yeah. But that, Marv, since the foreign players came into English football, that things changed. Yeah. Because they didn't drink. The Italian players came over, the Zolas of this world and, you know... They, they, they weren't drinkers to the Canios, they were Italian players or whatever. They'd been brought up with a certain, you know, they they, they, they looked after themselves, they were in great condition. Whereas English, the, the culture of English footballers was after a game, go around a pub all together yeah. and have a dozen, you know, start drinking, like have a, like get on the lagers or whatever you were drinking. Yeah. They didn't do that, they didn't drink, they were non-drinkers, they were totally dedicated, real, very, very professional. So would you say the best footballers in the game are the ones that uh, don't drink and have the decent diets? And well, you, you will always get the exceptions, you know, you'd have geniuses like Jules Best, wouldn't you? Yeah. Jules was a genius, you know, and Jules, like, you know, we all know how Jules lived his life, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I loved Best, he was fantastic. But, you know, even, I managed Bournemouth. And um, for 10 years, and Luther Blissett, I signed Luther Blissett, and Luther had been to Italy and played at Milan, and he came to the club and he changed the culture of the club more than I did, I was a manager, but he got all the players eating the right food, on a preparing, he, he was helping them do their diets, what they was eating, not what their wives should cook for them, and you know, drinking water instead of drinking lager, and you know, everything was about fitness with Luther, he was in great nick, uh, he, so he played in Milan and that's where it all came from with him and he, he was brilliant for me that the, suddenly the players were eating past, you know they weren't eating rubbish food anymore and they all looked on and he, he, he helped me take the club forward in, in, in a big way mm. and that was that was through Luther Blissett there you go. so um, another player that you managed that ended up at Milan but maybe didn't settle in quite as well Abel Tarrat tell us a little bit about Abel oh, Tarrat well, he was, our, he was a, again, what a talent. I mean, my God, could he play? He could really do things, you know. He was, but, uh, I mean, Mark Hughes had a... I think Mark Hughes got an OK with him. No, sorry there. Mark Hughes got an OK with him. Um, it was certain, you know, he was hard work. When, he was at Tottenham before yeah, I went to Tottenham. I was a Tottenham manager. I was hoping he was going to come through. He looked like the most talented he was a, Yeah, I used to years. go and watch the reserves play when I was managing Portsmouth. I'd go and watch Tottenham reserves play at Leighton Orient. Clive Allen was managing Tottenham reserves. And in, every week I went, or every other few games, he'd get pulled at subbed. And he'd have a row with Clive and storm off. And then he wouldn't run about. He was one of them. He pre-season, he wouldn't. He didn't want to do the training. He didn't want to do a bleep test to test his fitness. He wanted to train That's with the question. ball. How yeah. often do they do the bleep tests? At the start of the year, you you know maybe do it with them, see where their fitness are. But if it, we, now, it it's all run by fitness coaches. You've got fitness. Every club now has got fitness coaches. We didn't used to have. They used to be the manager, the coach like me. 
who you know wasn't an expert in fitness, but you know I'd, you'd run them and work them and do whatever. Now the fitness coaches, they they're really very scientific with their approach to, yeah, to yeah. the fitness. Like back know. in the day, when uh, how, how often would they do the bleep test? Certainly do it. They do it. They do it pre season, and maybe you do it three or four times during the year. See where their fitness is. Okay. You'd have all the records of what they've done at certain times, and that you know. But so even, I try to instill my lads to do it once a month. Mm, that's brilliant. Yeah, to get them all to do. I'd say do more exercise, and then you're not going to get caught up. Yeah, yeah. You know I mean? No, that's brilliant. I think to get them to do it, but he he would he wouldn't do the pre season hard. He he'd he'd get fit. He'd oh my back's hurt, and he'd come out when the ball came out. But as a footballer, and I liked him as a kid, really. I, I ended up having a fall out with him, but you know, but he was a, certainly he was an amazing talent. So talented. I mean, the yeah. passes would go outside the first. Oh, some of he, the could do, he could do special things. Yeah. And uh, that season at QPR, he yeah. was absolutely unbelievable. He scored, I think it was over 20 goals and over 20 assists that's in the right. same season, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, that's where he got the move to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now he's, I don't know what he's doing. He's, he's in Benfica. I think he played a bit and played, you know, he's played. I don't know, probably a couple of dozen games in the last four years. Yeah, that's no, uh, certainly wasted time. Yeah, yeah but he, he, he could play, there was no doubt about that. Mm. So talking about some of your favourite players, um, you obviously got Crenshaw. Nico, yeah, yeah I love Defoe Nico. or Crouch. Who's, who's, who's that? Player? Nico? Nico, Crouchy or Defoe? All of them, all three of them, I loved them all. Nico, I took Crenshaw to, um, to Portsmouth. And uh, he was a good player. He had great ability. He was a good player when he came to Tottenham. Fantastic. When he played, I mean, him and him and uh, Luca playing together. Do you know what? The, the the I've had some great Croatian players, great lads. They were just special people. I I found them amazing. Every one of them that I managed, and I've had all the I've had some great ones. Yeah, Robert Prozanek left back as well. He was the um, for uh, Tottenham. Who Choluka. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Um, I but remember Robert Prozanecki, I had Robert yeah. Prozanecki. Oh my God, when you talk about a player, but you talk about looking after yourself. He, he, he I mean, he used to smoke about 80 fans a day. He was <laughs> overweight. He could do his ability. I mean, he played for Barcelona and Real Madrid. Yep. I mean, he was one of the all time great footballers, but he really didn't look after himself. But he was a genius, you know. I had Davos Suka, mm. who was a you know top player. Say Luka Modric. So would you say the managers of old are more personal with the players than the managers of new? Do you think the relationships are different? Because you seem, when you're talking, you seem like you have real close relationships with everybody who played with your team. Like. Yeah, I like to think, uh, you know, I've got... Uh, you sound like with... you're talking about your pals. Yeah, when yeah. When you're sitting there talking about... Oh, I, I, I am, yeah, I see them now. I see them now and, you know, we all... I see Crouchy, do not I? And, you know, and... I love seeing him and, and, and Jermaine Defoe, you know. I haven't seen Nico's probably back in uh, in Croatia living now. But when I see them all, they, yeah, we all... Have you got that? You yeah. Know, you know the look of, yeah. like, you're pleasant, remember, like, you're looking, like, happy. Like, yeah, yeah. About yeah them, I had you know great mean? times with them, you know. And, uh, no, I always look forward to seeing them and follow their careers. And, uh, I've, you know, I've managed some great players, you know. Even people said to me the other week, what would be your best, you know... And I went, well, I sort of suddenly, I'm looking at the, I said, I'd probably play three at the back. He went, who, who would your three centre halves be? I went, uh, Ledley King, Sol Campbell, and Rio Ferdinand. Imagine yeah, them three oh, together. Oh, oh Imagine them three. Stuart Pearce at left back. Imagine him. Me. Stuart Pearce. So how long have you actually been in football now? Well, I left school at 14. Right. And... Um, I, I six, went straight to West Ham yeah. at 14. Was not Tottenham, <laughs> 11, you're not connected to Tottenham? Yeah, 11. I used to go train. At, I, was pl I played recently under and under 11s, right? The school. Yeah, he's done his due diligence on you, mate. Never have yeah, him, The mate. district. So we're playing, we're playing at um, Millwall Football Ground at the Old Den in the final of a cup competition. It might have been the Chris, Chris Shield. I think it might have been. Got and some we're, memory as well, we're playing once. We play, yeah, playing one, one, uh, Wandsworth. In the final with the English school, the final with the uh, Chris Cup or whatever it was. And I remember walking up, we won four. And I walked off the pitch at the end. And as I'm coming up the tunnel, there's a man leaning over. The, Hello, son. He said, uh, I'm only like little skinny little thing, 11 years of age. Is your dad here? I went, yeah. He said, I'm Dickie, Wal Dickie Walker. He said, I'm uh, Tottenham Scout. And Dickie, 
and Dickie was the captain of West Ham as a player, mm. left, finished at West Ham, his career, didn't get a job there and ended up scouting for Tottenham. He looked like a film star, Dickie Walker, silver grey hair, always big overcoat on, really lovely guy. Anyway, so he said, we come out after, so he said, I'll wait, wait outside. And, you know, I said, yeah, my dad's here. When we come out, I've gone in the dressing room, I'm 10 foot tall and I, all my little mates were all 11 years of age. I said, Tottenham scouts, I was going to go to Tottenham. But yeah, oh, Harry, Carl, really? Yeah. Anyway, we come up, he, we, he's waiting for me and my dad, and so he arranges for us to go down to Tottenham, right? So we get on the bus, get on a bus, get on a train, we get to White Hart Lane station. Dickie's there, going to meet, he walks up, the, up to the stadium with us, we're going to meet Bill Nicholson, the greatest manager Tottenham ever had, right? He, he was the double winning manager yeah. back in 60, 61. And so we got, I mean, he was a dour Yorkshireman. And I remember like, we'd gone up to meet him. And he, hello, son, he said to me, oh, oh, hello, Mr. Nicholson. He said, where'd you play? I said, I played right, right wing. He said, do you score goals? I said, no, not many. He said, I only know one winger that never scored many goals. His name was Stanley Matthews. He said, I don't think you're going to be as good as him. I said, I don't think so, Mr. Nicholson. <laughs> and that was it, you know. But, uh, yeah, so that and so we used to go training. I used to go train at Tottenham. Uh, different world. We had never had a car. My dad never had a car. But so we used to get in the mornings during the school holidays, six weeks, summer holidays, and it was me and another boy called Peter Knapp. He, he lived, played with East London boys, but he, Peter was a few years older than me. And I used to meet him in the morning. He lived half a mile from me, but I'd meet him. We'd get, again, get a bus, change the bus, get on the train. Like a long way to Chesham from the east end of London, you know, from Poplar. But every morning at seven o'clock, we'd leave home and we'd go train at, at, at Chesham. Mm. And you'd see the first team would be training. Dave Mackay, Danny Blanchflower, Jimmy Greve, John White, incredible players. They were the best team in England, the double winning team. And I'm 11 and we're all having lunch in the same area and we're tra I'm training with the little kids, you know, a little group of us. It was amazing, really, a great time for me, you know. So uh, why didn't things work out? Tom? Why did you well, go to Well, they did. Uh, no, I could have gone to Tottenham and I used to go training there then, uh, and Arsenal, Chelsea, I had a choice of all the, all the clubs. Okay. Um, and when it came to leaving school, we used to get invited down to watch the youth team playing the youth cup at West Ham. And Ron Greenwood, uh, you know, West Ham had a team where they all came through the youth. Tottenham had a lot of players. They bought a lot of they had a lot of Scottish players. Tottenham they bought a lot of great players in Dave Mackay, John White. They was all bought Greavesy. Whereas West Ham had a conveyor. All every player at West Ham had come through the youth team. Yeah. And I thought you'd get a better, you know, I'll get a better chance there because they just kept producing their own players at that yeah. time. And the goalkeeper who played with East London boys, he was my best mate, Colin McElwurf. Um, and he was going to West Ham. They were signing him. So I went, so I wanted to be with Macca. You yeah. know, we were big inseparable mates at the time. And so I uh, I went to West Ham. Mm. And my first year there at 15, um, we won the FA Youth Cup. Yep. It was under 18 and a half competition. And we beat Liverpool in the final um, over two legs. We went to Liverpool, got beat 3-1, came back at home. And we're losing 2-1 at half-time at Upton Park. It was cup final night. 30,000 people at West Ham. And I'm only 15. I mean, we... Incredible. And, yeah, and then... So we're 3-1 we're down in the first game. 2-1 down. So we're getting beat 5-2 on aggregate. And second half, we had a big centre forward called Martin Britt. He, got, he scored four headers and we beat him 6-5. It was the most amazing night. You know, it was a great atmosphere. Great game. 30,000 people there. And uh, yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, indeed. So back on to um, Tottenham briefly. Talk to me a little bit about Gareth Bale. What a player he was. Was he the best player you managed? You said yeah, I would say wise, yeah. you said to Canio, but in terms yeah. of the finished product, was it? Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, Gareth, you know that spell he had when you know, um, you know, we went we played in Champions League and got in the Champions League. He, he was just unplayable, really. How fit was he? How fit was oh, he? fit as a fiddle, yeah. He could run long distances, short distance. So I try to get the youngsters in my academy, right? I try to explain them that it's because of his stat vest that he was worth so much money and I program them to work on their fitness, their recovery mm. and their, everything they've got to do because if you ain't fit, you can't use your skills for too long. That's most of it, I think, isn't it? The fitness, the yeah. athletic ability of it But you know yourself, incredible. there's some kids, you can, you, can, you can tell some kids and they'll do it, won't they? It's... Yeah. You've got to have that, haven't you? Like we're talking about boxing. 
when you know yourself, when you're in that ring and someone's pummeling, the heart you must, I can't imagine what it must be like, but the heart you have to have to, to keep going when you, you know, and not, it's like anything, isn't it? You know, you've got to want to do it, haven't you? You've got to. Mm, yeah, boxing is different, isn't it? Like, yeah. Like, like you said earlier, you don't mind going on the pads, but you don't like the thought of getting in. Yeah. Whereas I like the thought of getting in. Uh, mm. And it's not in a kinky way, but it's more of a, when I was growing up, I wanted to be hard. Mm. So I wanted to know I was hard. And the only way I could know I was hard is if I could take your punch. Yeah, yeah. So I, the, the more punches I could take, the harder I felt. Mm. So it was just, if I take the punch, I'm hard. Yeah, you yeah. can't knock me out, I'm double hard. So mm. it was just, just a crazy, in, like, insane mindset I used to have. But yeah, that, that's what drove me to boxing. But you've got to have that, haven't you? You can say to some kids, do this, do, you know, look, you want... Frank Lampard Jr., right, take Frank. Now, he was at West Ham, came to West Ham, and I managed West Ham. And we signed Frank. His dad, he was my brother-in-law, uh, Frank Sr. He married two sisters. So young Frank comes and we take Frank on. Everybody said to me, he'll never make it. You know, even, even the youth coaches at West Ham said, he'll never make it. He can't run out. He can't get around the pitch. You know, he's not an athlete. And he trained... It was like every day after training, it'd be like that dark, getting dark. He'd still be out on the training ground with a bag of balls up to a cone, shh, 25 yards from goal, past a cone, bang, right foot, go back, get another ball, up, bang, left foot. Then he'd do his sprints. He'd put his spikes on, do his sprints. He'd be doing little sharp 15 yards, going, turning and going 15 yards. Then he'd go and run around the street at night and run like three or four... He just wanted to be a footballer. Other kids, you can say, look, get some spikes. It'll make you quicker. Do your spike. Yeah, uh, yeah okay. They don't do it. Yeah. He did. Harry Kane is exactly the same. Harry Kane couldn't get him off the training pitch. Every day after training, out there practising. Wanted to be a great. Wanted to be a, so a to footballer. So to be great, you've got to do a lot more than everybody else. Oh, a lot, yeah. yeah. Hard work and determination. Uh, Ronaldo. You talk about Ronaldo. See, I, I, I spoke to Angelotti. Uh, when he managed Real Madrid, they, Real Madrid came and played Bournemouth in a pre-season friendly, which was an amazing thing to do. They got him over here, and I went, I went and had a coffee with him at the, uh, the hotel just around the corner from where we live. And he said to me, uh, "Ronaldo, it's the first one in every morning and the last one to leave every day. First one in the gym in on the pitch, the last one off the pitch at the gym every day. They've all gone home, and he's still tra he's still working." Oh, that's why he's 30 what is he now he could he'd be a player until he's 40 years old he's in, he's I gone. mean when you talk about the greatest players in the world he's got you know got what he's achieved what he is what he does is amazing isn't it yeah and so what he's, about Bale though was he the same sort that you talk about in terms of the training uh, no no Gareth would never train no Gareth was a good trainer never yeah. a bad trainer but he wouldn't have been one that you'd have said no he, he wasn't you don't hang about after no he wasn't one for you know he wouldn't have been like Ronaldo what we're talking about him and, and Harry Kane was probably Harry worked more because probably wasn't as natural as Gareth a lot of kids a lot of boys are not natural some boys can just go out and play can't they they're geniuses or whatever they do but some lads they've got to make themselves and practice and like Frank did like Harry Kane did because yeah. Harry Kane uh, funny last week I spoke to Eddie Hearn and um, his dad when his dad was the chairman of Leighton Orient he rung me up I was managing Tottenham he said Harry was struggling with bottom of the league he said you ain't got anyone a couple of players any players we could loan have you he said we could look like you know, we're going to get relegated I said I've got three kids here you can have he said yeah I said yeah um, I said you can take uh, there's a boy called Kane Harry Kane Andros Townsend, awesome. and uh, Ryan um, um, oh, blind, Ryan Mason. Yeah. Three great players. So he went, really? I said, yeah. He said, they're any good? I said, yeah, they're, they're good kids. He took the three of them. They all went on, all went on to play at Ringland, yeah. all three of them. And they went, shot them up right up the league. But he said to me the other day, uh, and I spoke to young Eddie, uh, Eddie Hearn the other day, he said to me, I thought that the three of them, Kane was going to be the last one, the least chance of making it. I thought he's good, but he never played the Tottenham. 
Yeah. Yeah, he's ended up there. Well, he was never making crazy noise when he was in the youth stuff. No. Like when he went to Leicester, he didn't do great. He couldn't get a game at Leicester. Manstrom, didn't it? When they get that Manstrom, yeah. mate. He couldn't, get, that. he couldn't get a game at Leicester. He wasn't the one being spoken about. It was people like Sarap and people like that being spoken about them. He couldn't get it? in the team at Leicester. They went there on loan and never played him. Yeah. But again, his attitude is fantastic. Mm. Train, work, great lad, wants to be a top, you know, he's I just he's amazing, isn't he? Yeah. He's the best in the world of yep. his type now. Cool. You know, he's not Ronaldo and he's not Messi. But he what he, the way he what he does all round is just incredible, isn't it? He leaves the line and hold the ball, bring people into play, score goals, fantastic. Yeah, so um on the topic of Tottenham, would uh, how easy or difficult was Daniel Levy to deal with? No, not difficult at all. No? No, I got on well with Daniel. Never had a minute's problem with Daniel. Why would you ask that? Because it's the public perception is that he's super shrewd. He's the uh, chairman of Tottenham, so he's super shrewd, super hard to deal with. Apparently he's reputed to be very tight and very wise with business dealings. And so the, the public perception is there's other chairmen that are easier to deal with than him. He's an unbelievable businessman and that's why it makes it yeah. difficult to deal with as a manager trying to get the money out of him and stuff like this and is it is that a wrong perception or no I never had a pop no I got on well with Daniel I was offered the job at Tottenham two years before I took it I went to, I was managing uh, Portsmouth and got a phone call offering me Martin Yarl was a manager and I went to Daniel's house and met him on two occasions and he offered me the job uh, and I didn't take it I said I think you've got your manager He's doing, you know, I said, I wouldn't be a popular signing. I said, the people like Martin Yole. He's doing, I think he's doing a good job. I said, I don't think it'd be a good move, you know. I don't know why you want to replace him, but for whatever reason, they want to make a change, you know. And I said, no, look, you know, let's leave it. I, I'm happy with, I am at Portsmouth, to be honest. I said, I've got a good team. It's a good club for me, you know. I said, see how you go. If in the next six, eight weeks, you know, Martin doesn't have a good time and it's different, but at the moment, I think he's, you know, it would be difficult to get rid of him and bring me in. They went, you know, but he really wanted me, but I didn't take it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second time, you know, he came back again uh, and I decided to go. And it was a great move for me. You know, it was a great club for me to manage Tottenham. But no, Daniel was never a minute's problem to me. He was, I, I got on very well with him, really. I mean, Joe Lewis is, uh, is, the, is yeah. the boss, you know. He's very quiet, though, isn't he? He's not. I mean, I think he's probably been to about ten games in twelve years or whatever. He don't. He don't go. He don't go. I think it was purely a um, fine. It was an investment. He an bought top level businessman, isn't he? Oh, incredible! He's so well. He's so rich. It's just ridiculous. Crazy. Um, so, if, if you ever got into football, what do you think you would have got into? I just worked in the docks. Yeah. Oh, nothing else I could do. I left school with completely no education whatsoever. I went to the worst school in the East End. I went to, went to a school. In them days when I left school, you know, a junior school, in them days, you you had three tiers. You had a grammar school, if you were clever, a central, if you were decent, and a secondary modern, if you was useless. And I went to a secondary modern school. I had no, no interest in anything but sport. It was absolutely... And I went to a nut house called Sir Humphrey Gilbert, and we didn't, Is all we'd done was muck about, him, you know, but football, football, that's all I was interested in. So you was literally from the working class environment, from the street, so to speak. Oh, my dad was a docker all his life. My dad was football mad, my old man. So no special privileges, no, no silver spoon. No, my dad was, no. no we no, just. Why I ask is, I work a lot with the youngsters now on um, intervention, on opportunity building, choice making. And a lot of these kids say they never had any options, never had no choices, they because of the environment they come from and that. And when I listen to you speak, knowing what I know now about life, um, it's even myself, I made some traumatic choices, mm. like really traumatic choices when I was a kid growing up, up until my mid adult, even as a grown adult, as a parent, I was still making mistakes to the age of 40. But so actually hear that you haven't come from anywhere special with any silver spoon. Your dad was a worker on the docks. Yeah. You went to grow up and you just got in, into something you loved. You focused all your energy to drive yourself forward, doing something positive in something that you loved. And because of the, the loving environment you come from, sort of the working environment you come from, the 
living environment you come from give you the the minerals to be the uh, manager of all these clubs yeah and the savvy to deal with anyone from anywhere mm. you know i mean because all the conversations you've had i've listened to you talk about managers from this country man, like you've got on with everybody everywhere yeah and it's just the point i'm making is that even from a working class environment you can achieve greatness because from a working class environment if i was a footballer you've actually achieved mm. greatness as a young kid being of wanting to be a footballer to actually become the manager of the premiership football yeah. clubs you know what i'm saying so like, yeah it's that in itself that i'm gonna sort of mold and use as a as a beacon or a measuring stick to say kids well look harry's mm. from the same place where from you can't use these excuses mm. now um growing up did you get in any bother with the the other the law and things like that was you no, straight into football no i was into football but I, you know when i left the junior i went to a junior school that was a smashing little school in poplar called susan lawrence school and i had a sports teacher mr anever who he, he was football and cricket mad and and he liked me. I was his favourite because I was I was football. I loved the. I played the football team. I played for the cricket team. But he said, and when I the eleven plus came, and I was just at the goal. The, what the, I had no choice. It was two natty schools because I was no good at you know at, at, to uh, academically. I was absolutely useless. And he said to me, "You're going to Humphrey York at school." He said, "There's two ways you can go now." He said, "You're either going to keep your you know not keep doing what you." Concentrate on your your football and your sport, and or you're gonna get him. You can get him easily. Get him with the wrong things there. You know, I mean, I was one of the lads. Don't get me wrong. You know, but you made the right choices. But you know, I, I wasn't. Yeah, and football was. You know, football was. That was all I ever wanted to be. And so being trained at Tottenham at eleven, from it kept me through the school. Mm. You know, when other kids were getting in trouble, and you know, I always thought, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. You know. That's what I want to use because mm. you come from the working class environment after the war where most of the prolific criminals in England come from or mm. started from. Uh, even from as far back as Darby Sabini from Clerkenwell and all the, the, the hats and the craze and all these people from them generations and you became a football manager, mm. a football star and then manager. Yeah, yeah. And like it's... How did you make it through all that? Because like, I know you're from East London, right? Mm. And Cannon Town was really prolific. Bethnal Green, popular of in every criminal activity growing up as a kid. I was mm. over there in the 80s doing madness. But it's actually coming from the pits of that environment and becoming who you've become is absolutely a mm. phenomenon and an amazing achievement. Yeah, and always, I'm so proud to actually call you my mate now. <laughs> so like, but but you know, I, mean, I mate, wish I'd, uh, you know, you, I, I don't, I'm not proud that I've, I haven't got an education. I, I can't write a letter. I've never wrote a letter in my life. I never, ever, ever have I ever wrote a letter. I can't, I couldn't write a letter. I write like a five year old. And, and I'm, I couldn't, you know, if I'm like a certain sign, can you write, write this for me? I can't, it's terrible. But, you know, I don't so know. So I have something. But I had can't kids be perfect, at, Dad. But I had kids at the school, <laughs> funny enough. I had kids, can't you know, perfect, we had kids right? in my class at school that left school who couldn't read or write. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, I mean, it seems crazy, isn't it? Well, I learned, I learned to read and write in prison. Yeah. Uh, that's where I learned to read. I couldn't read and write. Because I had dyslexia, I couldn't read things. And I used to try and pretend I knew what the words meant or the sentences, but I was, and then I'd get embarrassed to read, so then I'd fight in class. So mm. I was one of them really disruptive kids that, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's crazy. And you, you, you felt that, and this is the thing about me as well. I could have got into boxing, but then I felt like a tramp because I never had the gear to go boxing with. So when I went boxing, I was like the tramp at the boxing club. So I thought, I, I, I want to go and make some money with mm. these lot. I want to hang about with these lot. But you was, you was. But I loved the. Boxing, I mean, and... boxing was, you know, I mean, as you say, a lot of boxers, boxers come out of, you know, around all the parts. But East London was always a good little Charlie Magri lived in my block yeah. of flats. Mm. Charlie, Charlie lived out. We that's lived a, that's going back, man. That's Charlie, proper old, isn't it? Charlie, isn't it? I Charlie. Forget how old, you know what I forget how old you are, Harry, because yeah. you look so. You really, Charlie I'm not brilliant. saying it blinds yeah. woke up your rectum, but I'm telling you now, you absolutely you don't look more than 55, 60. Yeah. No, you don't look old. Like, no, no. You no. haven't got an old looking <laughs> face. Do you know no, what I mean? no. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? You don't look old, does he, man? Yeah. But it's Charlie, mine. I remember Charlie moved into our flat, Charlie Magri. Mm. <laughs> and in, it was in, that was in a time where there was only English people. 
there weren't no foreign people here really yeah. and Charlie came in uh, with all his brothers Georgie Joey they all moved into the flats and didn't speak English and uh, I think they were like French Algerians or something yeah. you know and my dad one day my dad said to me yeah he went I went to York Hall last night he said guess who was boxing I went no he said oh, Charlie Magri I went shut up he's a jockey Charlie and he went oh he's a he went I tell you what Harry he'd be a world champion I went, I swear to God, I went, no, you're kidding, Dad. He said, he, Harry, he's brilliant. And my dad used to carry his bag. Wherever he went, Charlie, he'd go with Charlie. Follow him everywhere, awesome. my old man. He loved it. My dad boxing. Yeah. He used to, Frank Warren used to leave, to give my, my dad used to, to put the programs on the seats. every And for doing that, he'd let the old man have a ticket at the boxing. At your <laughs> ball, you know? <laughs> so he followed Charlie everywhere. And yeah, so... Charlie Magri, but all them fighters, Terry Spinks. And like you said, quickly on the Charlie, he did go on to become a world champion. Yeah, like said, yeah, with, yeah. Uh, it was with Jimmy Tibbs, wasn't it? Was his trainer um, during them times yeah. as well. So. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the Tibbs family, I mean, they're canning town, and yeah. I see the boy, I think Mark was in the corner. Mark was in the corner. Was he? Mark was in the corner the other day yeah. of... Uh, of Billy Joe Saunders yeah. on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, I spoke, I spoke to him this morning. Did you? Yeah. yeah, I spoke to him this morning. I'm, uh, Jimmy, I'm yeah, I know good. Jimmy. I know Jimmy well. Yeah. Jimmy's. Uh, right, you seem you like you're from the working class sort of uh, environment where the, the stereotypical impression of an East London man would be that East London's a villain, gangster, sort of toe rag, right? Did that sort of stigma stick to you in any way, shape or form throughout your career? Did you think I think I think I think I think because you got a cockney accent, people think, oh he's you know um I do think people do label you, don't they, when you do you think you got dug out throughout your career? Not yeah, I think think people people yeah I did read things at times that you'd think yeah, I remember one guy, Tony's um what was it uh, Tony Banks I think he wrote for the Mirror, right? Arsenal versus West Ham. Uh, in come Harry Redknapp for his press conference. Uh, he's wearing a suit. Probably looked like he must have bought it on Rumford Market, right? <laughs> all right it's all... Uh, whatever. And, t- and then in come Arsene Wenger. Looked like, you know, like he'd just been dressed in Savile Row and all that. You know what I mean? I went... I said, my suit... I say cost, Arsenal, no, though, I went. My suit probably cost twice as much as Arsenal. I said, "What yeah. are you talking about?" Like, but because you're an East, they think, "Oh, you bought your suit on Rockford Market yeah. or the back of a lorry somewhere, didn't yeah. they?" You know what I mean? It was like, it was a bit like that. Yeah, I did find at times that people were, you know, people did think stereotype, stereotype, you didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, because it, it, even I want to speak on this because it's just the way I am. I actually did believe that you growing up, you must have had loads of villains around you, right? Like. Being from that part mm. of the town, you'd, like, I wouldn't expect anything different. Do you know what oh, I mean? no, we used to go in the pub. My, every Saturday night, we'd end up in the Blind Beggars. Okay. Right? We'd end up in the Blind Beggars. See, I forget how old you are. Yeah, but now the, gov- the Blind Beggars belong to Patsy and Jimmy Quill. Okay. They're two fantastic fellas, right, Patsy and Jimmy. I still, I still speak to Jimmy. Patsy passed away. I still speak to Jimmy all the time. Jimmy was big pals with Bobby Moore. And Jimmy was a boxer. He was a fighter. Jimmy could have a fight. My God, he used to he used to come on a Saturday night if it if it got kicked off in there. Jimmy used to come over the bar like Superman, right? You know, he was about your stamp, you know. Yeah. And he'd come over the bar, Jimmy, bosh, 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 right? And it'd be about free. It all finished quickly. But he should look after us. But I remember going in there one night with with me, Frank Lampard, Bobby Moore. We played at Wolves away. Got the train back. Moro went. Uh, Thanks you, quick one, Lager. Uh, yeah, all right, Bob, yeah. We're, so, where you going? Where do you want to go? Well, we're coming, popping the beggars. We've got popping the beggars, have one. All right, lovely. So we go in the blind beggars. It's quiet, nearly empty. Uh, it's early. It's still only like quarter to eight, up past seven, eight, and they fill up to a bit. We go in there, Morris said, we'll have, have a quickie. Having a drink. I went to the toilet. As I walk in, there's a fella in there. It follows me into the toilet. Come out the other bar. He, if ever you could imagine a gangster, this guy was the gang. He had the big o- overcoat on, black hair like that. He had a big scar here, right? So he's coming. I'm in the toilet. He got me. Tell your mate Bobby Moore. I'll cut him from here to here. 
I said, what for? What, what, why? What's he done? What, why? what do you mean? He we thinks he's a film star. I said, anyway, I'll go back. Before I have a chance to say anything to Bobby, Bobby's drunk his long. He said, I'm off. See you in the morning. He used to always come in Sunday morning tomorrow. I come in Sunday. I said, God, look. I said, it was a geezer last night. It was, I mean, where? Why? I said, I don't know. I said, we hadn't, he said, we hadn't even seen anyone. We hadn't looked at anyone. We just did a couple of lagers and we were gone. I said, I don't know. I said, he, was a he had a big scar on his face, black over, big up. He said, I'll ring, I got in there. He said, I'll ring Jimmy up and tell Jimmy I won't be going in there again. Anyway, he rang Jimmy, Jimmy Quill was his pal. You know, he said, Jimmy, there's a geezer coming last night. I was in there last night. Some bloke gonna cut me. Jimmy, what? He said, Harry, he said, he had a big scar on his face, a black. He said, he said was he, he was in early when you were there? He went, yeah. Oh, no. He said, oh, no. I think it's time to Tony's over. Jimmy said, I'll leave it with me. Anyway, I think the next night, Jimmy could have, he said, won't bother you again. When Jimmy took him out, totally bit of business, give him the biggest item of his life. You know, you do that, my mate. That would don't come. It was how it was, wasn't it? It was a different world, wasn't it? Mm. But you'd go in the pub. Well, if you go in the pub, and Ronnie and Reggie Crave used to go in the Grave Morris next door, and they'd be in there having a drink with a few of their pals, and their girl wives or girlfriends or whatever. They didn't look at you and go, who are you looking at, and want to yeah, come and beat you up. This, this is something that I want to talk about quickly while we're on it as well because everyone got this portrayal of them being growlers and there never was growlers like everyone that I know that spoke about the crazy they, they were very gentlemanly yeah. like, I mean like Ronnie was a loon and he used to lose the plot but they never spoke like growling they was very soft spoken people and even when I met Reg he was very soft so, and I was quite taken back because I expected to meet a growler do you know what I mean but they're proper gentlemanly like men, they wasn't growlers, which was and they, they, really they, they, didn't, they didn't come and pick on ordinary, you know, they wouldn't look at you and so, you know, who are you looking at, mate, or something. They, they did, it, it was way above that in terms of they, they fought with other villains, didn't yeah. they? It was like other gangs or whatever, where it was a whichever ones it was from South London or wherever, that's where they did, you know. But they didn't just come up and pick, you know, you didn't stand in a pub because they was in there and think, oh, they you know, they might come over and beat us up in a minute, we'd better get out of here. They didn't bother. I never saw them have any trouble in the pub on a Saturday night when we used to go in there, you know? It, so you never had any 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 wobbles, like, getting like, pulled into that world at all, growing up? No, 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 no. I went, to, so I, I went, I left school just for my 15th birthday and went to West Ham, and, and that was it, really. I was up and... No, I'm not, so how old are you now? At 70, I'm 73, 74 in March. See, and look... No prison, no headache, no stabbings, no shootings. 73 years of age, phenomenal family, lovely mm. kids. Healthy. I mean, healthy as you like. Yeah, yeah. All of never became a villain. Do you know what yes. I mean? And I guarantee most of the villains are from back there to look messed up with the dead, don't they? Do you know what I mean? It's mad. Yeah, but it was, it was very different, you know, very different. But uh, So you can come from the streets and you can make it and you can make something to yourself. Oh, you got to work hard. you got to yeah, work hard, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Work hard, stay focused, stay clean. Keep your head space clean. Yeah. Stay away from drink and drugs. And uh, crazy with me. And count, you know, count <laughs> to ten a lot of time. People count to ten. You know, you get the up with saying, you know. Well, I'm learning this now. Because someone said to me the other day, have I got the ump with the geezer that shot me? And I said, well, I had the ump when he first done it. But now I'm actually glad he done it. Mm. And I want to use what I've been through to go into colleges, schools and prisons and actually get these youngsters to stop holding on to these bitter, mad energies mm. or these bad feelings about something that happened. Like, if I go and retaliate, then I'm going to go to prison forever. Of course. Right, so what's the point? No, what do you want to be sitting in there for every day? I look at my beautiful kids now, and I look at them, and I look at their growth and their development. You just see, we've got a video. We've just done a video now uploading for the dressage, right? But she's getting picked for the dressage. She might be selected for it. She's Team G selection. It's fantastic, isn't it? She's got Team G selection for netball. And hockey, and now that's um, dressage. Do you know what I mean? So Fantastic. they're going phenomenal places, and that's coming from where I come from. So mm. that's why I'm so on this. You don't need to be a naughty kid. You don't need to be cheeky. You don't need to be a gangster. You don't need to steal. No. Like, you just need to work hard, stay focused, and committed to your one dream in life. Stay safe, stay focused, stay positive. But more importantly, stay healthy and stay fit. Mm -hmm. Especially if you want to get into sports. Oh that's, yeah, yeah. You know, like. Uh, just stay focused. That life, like you are a testament to the working class man. If there is any, there's no doubt whatsoever that 
There ain't a mother on the planet that wouldn't want their, their daughter to be with you at any stage of your career. <laughs> like, and that's like, when you think like me, yeah. I was every mother's nightmare Goals. till the age of 43. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I, I, I weren't even allowed in certain, like my friends weren't even allowed to hang about with me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah, like yeah. a pause that the mum used to go with me. No, no, they're not in. I'd be like, <laughs> but they're behind you. So like, yeah, they're not in, they're not in, they're not coming out. And that was it. So I'm like, he was like the, he was like the night, the night in shining armor yeah. for every mother and their daughter. Well, and that's that's a testament, man. And yeah, you know yeah. what? Yeah, so mate, mate, you, lovely to end you, mate. Yeah, it's so great well. to see you as well doing yeah. back doing. Well, such job is, I'm work. just giving back for everything I took out, of Harry. Mm. And I'm not, I'm not, the, I'm not, I'm not too proud to say that I failed. I'm not too big mm. to say I made mistakes and I wish I'd have done everything. I wish I'd have just mm. got a job now. I wish I'd have just stayed in school. I wish I'd have just worked hard. I wish I'd have never got involved with trying to be a gangster. I wish yeah. I'd never got involved in trying to be an armed robber. I wish I'd never got involved in trying to be an international bloody nutcase. But these are things I chose to do and I regret it 100% now. And who would ever have thought I'd be in Harry Redknapp's ass? Yeah, man. No. On speed dial. But Does now I, mean I know, I mean, it's, you know, you've got a heart of gold, really, you know. And Always you, you know, it. You've come up, you've come up uh, you, the hard way, haven't you? You know, it's, and a lot of it is, when you're a kid, it's just someone guiding you down the right path a lot of the time, isn't it? And that's you what know? I do now. That's what you All do All these now. kids now, I was getting, I got groomed as a kid, mm. so now I'm out there, like, really empowering the youngsters not to be groomed and make a right choice. If someone's giving you a product that can put you in harm's way, in danger mm. or in prison, then they don't love you. Mm. They don't love you. No. Do you know what I mean? Like, if they want to help you, nurture you, they'll support you, protect mm. you. They'll do that. They'll guide you. They'll do that. It's not mm. a problem, but they're not going to do something that's going to risk you going to prison, getting stabbed or killed. No. And that's what I try to teach them now. That if anyone's going to give you something that can get you stabbed, get you shot, get you hurt, get you put in prison, do you know what I mean? then they're grooming you. Yeah, yeah. And it's as simple as that. So yeah. I'm out there now spreading the word and anti-grooming campaign, not to in, incarcerate the youngsters' minds through grooming, so they end up incarcerated in souls, you know what I'm saying? Spirit and Absolutely. madness. Yeah. But there's people to talk to these kids, and you know, you can do more, like you talking to them and, you know, helping. They need, you know, there's so many kids out there, aren't there, who just, you know, recently I saw a kid nick my grandson's uh, scooter, right? Come up, a couple of kids, one of them had a knife or whatever. But I want to go and see that kid who nicked it and say, and what, what are you doing with it? Why, 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 what, what, are you, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing carrying a knife at 14? What are you, you're going to end up in prison the rest of your life. Well, you're going to get stabbed. What, you know, what are you doing? Look. When, when you're talking, I'm thinking, oh, I could have done that, I could have mm. done that. I mean, it's just about that work ethic, never mm. giving up, getting up before everyone else.